Wow. All right, folks are in the call. All right. Welcome, everybody. I, th I think we're going to wait uh, just a few more seconds and let some more folks uh, come on in to the meeting room, and then we'll, we'll get going here. All right, well, I'll go ahead and kind of kick things off here very quickly with just a few kind of uh, housekeeping announcements. Um, first off, just so that we can kind of cut down on confusion and cross chatter, um, all participants' microphones will be muted. Um, if you have any questions for our presenter, um, feel free to go ahead and enter those on into um, the chat. You can just type those down and we will uh, get to those questions. Um, and then, yeah, just also for all those folks uh, who might not want their image showing up, we, we are, um, we, this is going to be live broadcast on YouTube, and it will also end up uh, recorded on YouTube as well. So um, if, if you don't want your image getting out there, you can always just turn your camera off and um, you should be good to go. And now I will uh, turn things on over to Helen. Thank you so much. Uh, I am so excited to be here today. We have a fantastic presentation. Uh, President's Day is actually next Monday, but that is a City of Dallas holiday and we won't be here. So we wanna make sure we can get it in today. I'm gonna do a quick introduction and then I am going to introduce our speaker and then we're gonna start the fun. So my name is Helen Dulac and I am with the City of Dallas environmental quality and sustainability. And we are super excited to be partnering with the Dallas Public Library Seed Library on this weekly series called Grow With Us, which is most Mondays at noon. So just to give you a little bit of information about my department, because you've probably never heard of us, we were formed back in 2004. And back then we were called the Office of Environmental Quality. We worked really hard for four years to help Dallas become the very first city in the United States to achieve ISO 14001. And that is a special environmental certification. It's actually an international certification. And what it does is it makes you look at how you can provide service and lessen your impact on the environment. So we looked at the vehicles we used all the way to the paper we put in our copy machines and we made changes and we continue to make changes every year. And we are audited every year to make sure that we keep up this certification. And another thing about that, think about that. This is Dallas, Texas that did this first. It wasn't a city in California. It wasn't a city in Colorado, it wasn't Austin, it was Dallas that did this first. So we do have a history of being green and we're just trying to go greener. So let's fast forward to 2018 where a lot of changes happened to this department. Uh, there was a restructuring in the city and OEQ actually doubled in size. It absorbed some other environmental operations and programs. And to reflect that we changed our name to Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Also that year with that merger, we created a combined outreach and engagement team that I'm a proud member of. The following year in 2019, uh, Mayor Johnson created a council committee focused on the environment called the Environment and Sustainability Committee. They meet the first Monday of every month at 9 a.m. And those uh, meetings are broadcasted live. And it's a great way to see the green and environmental pulse of the city. You get to hear about all different things the city is doing, different pilot projects, and what's going on with different kinds of plants. And speaking of plans, if you have heard of this department, it's probably because just last year on May 27th, the city adopted its first climate, environmental climate action plan. We were one of the first cities in Texas to formally adopt a climate plan. And also we're one of the few inland cities, cities that are not on the coast that actually uh, are understand climate change and doing something about it. And this is our roadmap for the next 30 years on how Dallas is going to improve the quality of life for everybody and mitigate climate change at the same time. Even presentations like this are tied to that CCAP plan. Uh, goal six of CCAP is Dallas protects and enhances ecosystems, trees and green spaces. So I mentioned this department doubled in size. Those groups in green are what joined us in 2018. And I wanna talk about one of those just briefly and that is storm water. So storm water is anytime water goes across your yard and leaves your property, that it's not absorbed into the ground. So if it's from your lawn sprinkler systems, if it's from a hose that was left on, or if it's from the rain, or we, we even had snow melt not too long ago. Anytime water leaves your property, it can pick up pollutants along the way. 
So that water goes into the street, travels down the curb, all the way to that big drain at the end of the street. That drain is called a storm drain inlet. It's there for one reason, to remove the water so the streets do not flood. They do such a good job that that water is taken away and it connects into a stream or a creek. And that stream or treat, creek goes directly to one of our lakes or eventually the Trinity River. And the Trinity River actually flows an additional 500 miles all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So that means if uh, that water picked up some lawn chemicals you had, some bacteria from pet waste that wasn't picked up, if it grabbed some litter or maybe some automotive fluid that, uh, from the street or your driveway, those pollutants can actually end up all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. So please just be remindful about what you're doing outside, uh, pick up litter, and remember pollution doesn't stay in your neighborhood or even in your city. So I mentioned I'm a member of the outreach and engagement team and we wanna empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that by virtual presentations like this and in person when we're allowed. If you're in Dallas, we can present for free virtually to your meetings, clubs, organizations. We also have a lot of activities and presentations for students all the way from K to college. And we can also participate in your seminars and different events. Um, we also host some of our own events. Most recently we had the uh, WaterWise Landscape Tour of 2020, and you can actually see a virtual tour of homes that have zero grass. We call those zero turf homes. Think how much water you save and how much time you save not having to mow. So you can see those homes at savedalluswater.com. Now, if you invite us to speak, what do we talk about? Well, we talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. And with that, I wanna leave you with our website, greendallas.net. If you want to invite us out, just go to that website, go to the event request form, fill that out, and then someone will get in contact with you. If you ever have any questions for me or any of my coworkers, just send an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com. And if you don't mind, please follow us on social media. We are Green Dallas TX on Facebook and at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram so that you can learn about cool programs like this and all the neat stuff we have coming up. And speaking about coming up, it's about time to introduce our speaker. So our presenter, Lois Diggs, is a certified master gardener, class of 2012. She is with the George W. Bush Presidential Library Native Texas Park volunteer. She is also a docent and guide and she's been doing that since 2014. She is also a member of the Native, uh, the Native Plant Society of Texas, especially, and not only that, the Dallas Chapter Board member. Uh, and she's a certified master naturalist class of 2020. Lois continues to learn and share how to be a good steward of the Texas landscape and the importance of using native grasses and flowers in our urban landscapes. And I also know that Lois is excited about your questions. So please put those into the chat because I think that there's hardly going to be one that she can't answer because uh, her knowledge on native plants is extraordinary. So now Lois, uh, if you don't mind, please share your screen and let's get started with this fantastic presentation. Okay, here we go. Let's see if we can get this started. Dun, dun, dun. All right. I want to welcome you. Um, get your cup of coffee, get yourself set, relaxed. Uh, I usually give these talks out in the park. So this is kind of unusual, but I wanted just to um, make sure you're sitting there relaxing. And I apologize if as I move, I look like I've got antenna. This was for a event with my grandchildren. So just enjoy. So as you know, we're gonna be talking about the George W. Bush Presidential Library Museum. And that is located down on the SMU campus at 2943 uh, SMU Boulevard. The reason I give you that is if you would um, Google and you want to find that, sometimes if you don't put the exact address like that, it's gonna take you to our loading dock. And um, that's not where you wanna to be to be able to get into the park or the museum. But our park itself is open for 365 days a year, every day of the year, sunrise to sunset. Um, so that varies by the season and it's open free to all visitors. You do not have to go into the museum. You do not have to buy a ticket. Um, you may have to pay for parking somewhere because it is on a college campus. We try to give guided tours in spring and in fall and upon request garden clubs, whatever that may um, want to visit the park. Right now, because of COVID, we are not doing that. Um, if you go to our website of just George Bush Presidential Library, when we are open and NARA allows us to uh, start 
uh, letting people into the museum and the park, I'll be glad, or one of our docents to give you a tour. And specifically, all presidential libraries are nonpartisan non and they operate under the National Archives and Records Administration. And what that means, and the bottom line is that we hold all the records of specifically uh, former President Bush's um, time as governor and as president. So that's one thing you're going to start seeing as we go through uh, discussion of this. So um, right now I'm going to tell you the inspiration of what happened as to why we have this beautiful 15 acre park. And when Mr. and Mrs. Bush back in, um, I believe it was 2001, and they have their Prairie Chapel Ranch, I'll move my cursor over. And at the Prairie Chapel Ranch, they found that they wanted to bring back their prairie in the native area. So they spent over 15 years working on it to take out the invasives. You may have seen pictures of President Bush out there cutting down cedar trees and things on uh, riding his bike through the area. And that was what they were doing. And they worked with several people. And after 15 years, they brought it back and it ended up being 65 native species that were identified on their 1,600 acre facility. So that was pretty cool. All right, so we're gonna reclaim the prairie here. Now our area actually in Dallas is bounded by 75, an interstate on the east side by Bush Avenue on the west side, uh, SMU Boulevard, which is this area right down here. And then this is where there used to be practice, practice fields for the SMU students to practice football and have um, fun games out there. So we acquired 22 acres. And as you can see, there's some trees, but it's flat and it is just desolate because it is a lot of non-permeable surfaces there. So let's have a quick little tour. In a moment, we're gonna take a time-lapse video, but I want you to see how both Robert A. Stern Architectures, or Robert A. M. Stern Architects, and Michael von Falkenberg Associates, landscape architects plus building architects, working together to develop not only the building and separately the landscape, but all together. So the 22 acres of our campus was developed together to try to develop an appropriate facility that would um, share what Mr. and Mrs. Bush's vision was for that area and specifically give the ability for them to get their lead, um, which is your leadership and energy and environmental design guidelines. They got a platinum designation. So if we could go ahead and do our time lapse of the talk um, video right now and y'all see how this was done when it was made. So. If you need, turn up your volume, it's pretty good. I'm not. Okay, so are we back? Everybody see? 
All right, what I need to ask right now, and I forgot to do a poll, was um, all right, have you heard of the George W. Bush Presidential Library? Wow, and have you uh, been to the park before? And I need to ask if everybody can see my screen. If someone can unmute and tell me if we're still sharing the screen. No, it, it, uh, I had to take over the share, so you have to reshare it. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure. So let me go back in and share. Do, okay. Uh, I will end my slideshow and go back in to share. Sorry for the uh, inconvenience. Okay, so. 88% of you have uh, heard of the museum and 26% have been to the park. That is why we are doing this today. All right, so let's go ahead and start from our current slide. All right, so um, can I just X out of this poll, please? There. All right, so that's why we're doing this right now is uh, many people have heard about the museum, but behind the building is all of a sudden this wonderful 20, 15 acre park that no one has seen. So what I wanna do is I wanna share with you just a few of the uh, nuts and bolts, and then we're gonna go on a virtual tour. So when Mr. and Mrs. Bush had an opportunity to um, take this 22 acres and develop it, they realized as far as the landscape that they wanted to share their love of the Texas landscape, as you can see from the Prairie Chapel Ranch, and you've heard probably Mrs. Bush talking about. So they have a commitment to the environmental conservation and restoration to our area. And that's not just for our park, but that is, uh, I'll explain a little bit later, right before we leave our talk here. And the park should also contribute to the everyday life of the community and those people who visit. And that again is that you can come at any time, um, sunrise to sunset, 365 days out of the year. Now, along with all that, we have to have some sustainability objectives, uh, which was great what Helen was talking about because we wanted to restore the native habitat. Um, give an example for those who visit the three eco regions around the Dallas Fort Worth area. Specifically, we are in the Black Line Prairie. And that means we needed to increase biodiversity. You don't want to have a monocro uh, crop, just a, a certain type of tree. We needed to reduce the need for irrigation. We do have an irrigation system and a 252,000 gallon cistern, but it is rarely used. And it was only specifically used when we started and planted the area because we were in a drought. We also employ an organic maintenance program that replenishes the organic material, specifically the mulch. And its aim in the maintenance is to set up the conditions for those uh, plants that you want to have, your desired plants, not the opposite of going and get rid of what you don't want. And um, the, the park is maintained by a um, collaborative effort between specifically trained landscape contractors. Right now we are talking about Southern Botanical and they are regularly, regularly working with Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center to make sure of what the objectives are being taken. So let's go into the construction of the three na native eco regions. At the time, as you saw in that video, the ground was totally solid. There were parking lots, sidewalks. It was non-permeable surfaces. They had to go in and break all that up, remove it. They had to move. And as you may have remembered through the video, you saw some terracine and some hills all of a sudden showing up. They had to dig out an area and recontour all of the area, specifically to make sure water moves away from the building. Because as you know, there are archives in there and the last thing you want is water. So they want to make sure all the water goes away from the building. And they're using the soil that um, 100,000 cubic yards to make your hills and valleys to establish these three eco regions. So your three eco regions, if you aren't from Texas or you haven't done a lot of study about the Texas eco regions, we have 10. Uh, some groups say possibly 12 to 15, but I'm going with the Gould um, eco regions. And specifically, we are talking about the post oak savanna that is to the, um, I'm getting my directions uh, east of us, and it's over towards Canton. Then we are in the Black Line Prairie that goes all the way up to Canada and across timbers, 
which is over on the other side of by Fort Worth. As you see, this is Dallas County and that's kind of in the heart. You kind of need to know what eco region you're in when you want to plant. So a little bit about the Blackland Prairie. Um, as you may know, it was one of the, it's the tall prairie grasses, then there's short ones also. It used to cover over 400,000 square miles of North, Texas, of North America. And as they say, the original amount of that is only remaining 1%. So we have lost many, many of our um, prairies, the native ones. A good prairie uh, is composed of over 250 species of vascular plants. And vascular plants are just like our normal plants. They're the ones with your stem um, to uptake of the moisture and the uh, produce, I mean, the nutrients through the roots. And they help play a host of variety. Uh, they um, help increase the microbiotic and macrobiotic organisms. What we found when we were putting, and I use the term we loosely, but what they found when they um, brought back the prairie here and recontoured the soil is they needed to bring in um, the fungal microorganisms, the different things that would help feed that soil to give it back that wonderful nutrients. And they found they needed to use compost and compost tea specifically composed of leaves and trees, uh, grasses. You didn't want to put out there like what I have in my compost pile, my vegetables from my uh, kitchen. You didn't want that. You wanted to, and no manure, you wanted to have the leaf and the um, grasses. And if you think about it in the prairie, except for where you maybe had buffaloes moving around, you mostly had that decomposing, feeding the soil. Um, these are two of my favorite grasses the side oak grandma and the switchgrass, and it's supposed to be grandma, and I always say it wrong. Uh, I'll be sharing all these pictures. They're taken on site, or I've noted at the end of the presentation where I got them from. The post oak savanna, just a side note for any teachers, savanna can be written with an H at the end or not. We had a major debate about that as volunteers at the museum, and we stuck with the H. Um, this is on the east side uh, over towards Canton before you get to the Piney Woods. And again, it's got a scattering of oaks. Um, that's why it's usually the post oak savanna. We don't have as many post oaks in the Dallas area, but it is um, got a lot of your grasses and your wildflowers. And it's, it's really a wonderful area. We have several areas on the park that we call the post oak. And then the last one is the cross timbers that is over towards Fort Worth. And that is your area that is kind of between your prairie and your true forest area. This is at the um, park. And you'll see there's one little set of stairs right over here. And that's the only stairs we truly have right there on the park. So our park is ADA approved where you can go on flat surfaces. You do not have to go down those stairs if you don't want. But the cross timbers, has your trees like your pecan state tree, um, the Eastern Red Caesar, Caesar, Cedar, um, which is a great tree. Uh, some people don't like it, but it has, uh, and it's not really a cedar, but we won't go there. Um, it's got the juicy berries that a lot of birds have um, wanting to eat all the different wildlife. You need to have a male and a female to be able to have those berries. And then again, some of the small grasses, you might have the little blue stem, and the other top ones for prairie grasses, your big blue stem, Indian grass, switch grass, you know, and that would be there. So just a real quick about conservation, because if we're doing this, and Mr. and Mrs. Bush truly wanted to provide um, a learning, because we are a lifelong learning, uh, lifetime learning facility, all presidential museums are. And so what that means is that, um, we have received our LEED um, certification, and, uh, and that is just a given um, by the U.S. Green Building Council. You have certain requirements, certain things you need to do, but ours specifically was given because of the whole 22-acre facility, and so we're really proud of that. And one of the things that was high on that was that we followed the um, hydrology, and we're going to hit some of these places as we go a virtual walk through of the bioswales, the seep, the forebay, and having the wet prairie, um, uh, or also what you would call the cistern in the area. We do an organic maintenance uh, program, which again, we just add more mulch in areas that we need and compost. We have an integrated pest management program, which that of course starts at the lowest level um, 
I, I don't mean to say it because I love bugs, but squish the bug as opposed to then um, shoot them with the worst chemical you could. So that's where we start. And all of our pathways are either our grass that has been mowed a little lower or a permeable surface of decomposed granite. All right, let's see. The biodiversity you want to have in any landscape, and ours has, um, and we have it documented, and I could send you the list of the plants. We have 31 varieties of trees, and there are 900 specifically that thrive on the area. Um, we have, and this was at the beginning when we opened, which has been almost um, going on seven years. Um, and so the 53 varieties of wildflowers, now remember, when you want to plant, you want to plant annuals, biennials, and perennials. You want to have that succession through spring, summer, and fall. So your pollinators and your wildlife will have something um, to either lay eggs or to eat. And then, of course, we have our 36 variety of grasses, the tall and the short grasses, and they are some of the most fun. And you can put them in your landscape also. So as far as topography, which is the lay of the land, we are specifically um, divided up as to our native lawn, just like in your landscape at home. You have um, um, your habitat or your, say, St. Augustine or Bermuda. And then ours is nine acres, and then our prairie is only 6.2 acres. The wildflower meadow is 6.6 6 acres, and the wet prairie is 0.4 acres. So the main prerogatives is the native lawn, and we'll get into that. So now I have another question for you. If you're not from Texas, just go with us here. We want to know what is the state grass of Texas, and I've given you some pictures, and there is our poll, and let's see what people, I've given you a hint in these pictures. Um, so it's either blue stem, big blue stem, Texas grandma, blue grandma, side oak grandma, or Bermuda. So we're going to see, and we're going to give it about, oh, you know, until we get up to, say, over 70% of people doing. The reason I ask you this is you can put these in your own yard. This is not going to be a grass that you're going to be able to mow and have as your turf on your actual front yard. But all of these grasses, except for Bermuda, you would be able um, to uh, grow at your own landscape. So we've gotten up to 73%. So we're pretty good. Um, the Texas grandma, just because it's called Texas, I knew you'd probably maybe want to do that. That's not it. Bottom line is it's your side oak grandma. Uh, I gave you two pictures. And the reason for that is just that it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, um, I'm gonna X out of that. So you've got these beautiful seeds on the side. It only gets about two and a half, three feet tall, if that. And it's a clumping bunch grass, so you can kind of keep it in an area. So if you have a, an area that you're trying to figure out what to do, gets full sun, think about side oak grandma. Just say. So we're going to try to take a virtual tour. Now, usually I'm out there at the front meeting people um, and walking you down through where this purple line all goes, all this craziness. This is a lot of stuff to see. And one of the things on the website when you registered was they gave you a little PDF that you could pull off and print. And that's what this is. And it would give you this map and designations of what is at each one of those areas. But we're gonna try to do a virtual. So for right here, I'm gonna just give you the, we're gonna go in from the parking lot to the library entrance. We're gonna walk down some steps and go to the Institute. We're gonna to go to the uh, one of the main entrances, but there's also an entrance to the park off of Bush Avenue. We're gonna follow around to the Great Lawn. We're gonna hit the seep area. We're gonna keep walking down to the Wildflower Meadow, go across, across a wonderful a Black Locust Bridge, continue over to the Wet Prairie, hit the Four Bay and find out what that means kind of take a breather at the amphitheater and come back in front of the South Terrace and then you would just be on your own to go walk around. Specifically for those who may have been to the Bush Center, Cafe 43 that gives you an orientation because we're facing south looking downtown Dallas, but the north is at the bottom of the slide. But Cafe 43 is right here and a lot of people have eaten there. Good food, uh, very well priced. Um, and that's where you can kind of orient if you've been to the museum before. All right, so we're going to start in the parking lot. And I'm so glad that Helen talked about stormwater because the parking lot is like the beginning 
of everything about what Mr. and Mrs. Bush want you to understand is the parking lot is small. Um, we do give information about how to ride DART rail, our local bus and mass transit, and take a museum shuttle if we were open. But if you need to park, you can park there. It's um, designated for hybrid cars for park carpooling. But what I want you to see is this is one of the few times that it's rained and we got out there and took pictures. And this is one of our bioswales. All the contouring of the parking lot has allowed the water to come into our bioswale. And I'm sorry, but I'm beginning to get excited um, because what this does is it slows the water down. We've got stones in there. We've got all kinds of things. It is contoured to specifically slow down water. And we have our um, inland sea oats that are growing in there. Again, as a soil, um, it's holding the soil in and it's slowing it down so that any particulates, specifically pollution off that parking lot, will come into this area. And it's been contoured to go to either the east or the west, to go around the building to our cistern in the back. We also have multiple trees, but I love the chinapin. Uh, a lot of people spell it differently, but uh, I've given you all the botanical names so you can go through and make sure it's the right kind of plant if you're interested in it. And we also have a lot of Virginia creeper out there. So it is a pretty neat place to start. So you come over there, you walk to the front of the building and here you are, um, beautiful landscape. Along with our architecture, we have Luder limestone. Uh, there's a quick little thing that if you came and I gave you a tour, I explained to you about that um, the ground that you're walking on by the fountain, it's repurposed water. I'm going to leave that as a um, teaser that you have to come and go for a tour and we'll explain why there's no grout around that looter limestone that you're walking on. Anyway, so what I want you to see here is the ironwork on the sides because using the lead ideas of how to utilize um, your design of your building to help shade or provide in the different seasons. So you'll see the Texas wisteria over on the side. That branches out first with the green leaves and then it flowers. It's not like the Japonica one, which has the flowers first and then leaves, and it is a native, and it crawls up onto the, both of these ironworks on the side. And that provides shade during the summer, and then it's just a beautiful vine during the winter. Um, because you want a little bit of sun during the winter, but you want the shade and the privacy in the summer. So that's a really cool. So you're going to walk across in front of those ironwork and you're going to come and you're going to stand there and you're going to look out and see our grass. Now this is the most, probably the number one question we get when people come to the museum. They look at us and go, what's with this grass? What is the deal? Why don't they take care of it? Excuse me. <coughs> Um, you know, and the idea is, again, this is our native grass. We don't want to put Bermuda, St. Augustine. We don't want to water it. So what this is, is this is called Habiturf. You can actually find it if you Google or you do an internet search for a thunder turf. Um, but when we had it put in, it included your Texas grandma, your blue grandma, your buffalo grass, your poverty drop seed, and your curly mesquite. Now, if you purchase it, it comes as a seed and it's only got your blue grandma buffalo and your curly mesquite. Your buffalo is like a clump grass and you wanna have other things to fill it in, which is why you have the blue grandma and the curly mesquite. We mow it four times a year. Um, we have a special lawnmower because it keeps it fairly tall. And the most amazing, wonderful thing to me is you have these seed pods that come in the um, summer and fall and you come up to the front and you see those seed pods moving in the wind and it's like wow this is so cool but again not everyone likes this we are not saying you have to change and take out your grass but just something to think about and to understand why we have that there so you're going to keep walking down through the entrance to, um, towards the bush institute you go down these wonderful steps because again We've contoured the, the ground so that we're now getting down to a lower level and the water can go to the east and west. And so <clears throat> what you want is, this is an example we can use. You, when you have an incline, you don't want grass, you have to try to mow. So we have native grasses, we have our wildflowers, and we have a, several, we have a country and there's Mexican plum there, which is a great tree to have, even though it kind of gets messy because it drops its plums, but it's just amazing. Uh, it's first one to bloom out in the spring. 
And also we use uh, an example of how you can use native plant adaptive plants in a formal setting because people come to the Bush Institute, which is this wonderful building. And it's um, where Mr. and Mrs. Bush pursue many of their um, uh, interest. Uh, um, I'm losing my mind as to what all of the ones I don't have them written down, but when you hear of them having a news conference or a con or an opportunity for people to come and hear a speaker, it is at the Bush Institute. But when people drive up, they see our habitat, they see the two types of red buds that are native to Texas, they see our pecan trees and our live oaks, and then the right in front of the uh, windows and the entrance, they see your red yucca, Texas yucca, dwarf yield pond holly, which is amazing. We could all have it in, it is a natural mounding um, bush and it's small and it's just beautiful. And so that is just something that again, the bushes are trying to give an example of how you can do that, use these things in a formal setting. So now we're gonna keep walking around. We're gonna go into the official park. And we're gonna to go to one of the hydrology sites that we have. And we're gonna go, um, the reason I have this picture right here is as you're standing here, you can either go to the left and go down those steps that I've noted, or you can go through this shaded wonderful area with these wonderful trees. But also you can look to the right and you will see a mass of wonderful passion flora um, vine. And that is a host plant for a gulf fritillary. And that again, you want to maybe have a new landscape. I told you they weren't done. Um, so what we have um, is the seep is a 150 foot long stacked limestone. On the other side of it is our West Prairie. So what it is is again, that soil has been con contoured and we have our prairie grasses and some wildflowers and a few bushes and everything up there. But we're allowing the water to now come through that prairie, seep down through those rocks into a kind of what would be called a culvert. Uh, it is our bioswell rain garden. Um, and you wanna have your plants there that can handle the fluctuating water level. So that in our area, we have our maiden here fern, the spider lily, they get huge, the button bush, um, spider, a uh, spice bush, coral berry, great bushes we should all have. Uh, I'm kind of hawking all the landscape if you haven't noticed and our water oaks, sycamore trees. There are benches throughout the park and this is one of the nicest where you can sit in the shade and if it's raining, you can hear the water seeping through. It's just amazing. So you're gonna keep walking and you're gonna follow some of our bioswell, this area right down here. Um, we've had kids come out and when I've taken a couple of people with kids, they think they can jump over it, but it's quite large. So, um, uh, you're going to walk by it. So we have a full 2,650 feet of vegetated swale. And that's again filtering the storm water runoff. This is just again another hydrology um, mechanism that we're using to try to take the pollutants out of the water that's going into our cistern in the back. It can be reused. So as you come through here, you're going to kind of come and you come through on this side that this is hard to navigate and I apologize, but you'll come out to this area here. And this was taken, I believe in the fall, hadn't had, uh, or late summer, hadn't had rain, so it's looking pretty sparse. But this is going to be going over one of our bridges, and I'll give you more information about our black uh, locust wood bridge into our wildflower meadow. But again, we've got all kinds of wonderful things blooming to help keep the soil um, reju um, rejuvenated with that constant uh, dying of our um, plants and then the others coming back. So you're going to get into our wildflower meadow. Now we have over 53 wildflower varieties that were originally planted. We cannot say exactly if those are all still there or if others have come. Uh, some years we have some plants who are more dominant than others. Uh, the first couple years we had blue bonnets everywhere and then as time went on we had uh, Mexican, I mean, uh, Missouri primrose. We had the Maximilian sunflowers take over. We even had the dewberries, which are related to your blackberries that just were everywhere. So, but this is just an example. And that again is our black locust that we went through or went across. And there's a live oak tree right here. And this is where I like to stand and get the whole vista of the wonderful um, wildflowers. And of course, those are our blue bonnets. Again, we have a listing of all the different plants we have planted there. So as you continue walking around, you're gonna to get to our cistern or our wet prairie. 
Now, this is my favorite tree. It is the river birch tree and it is planted on the other side of our cistern. So you're looking at the very south tip of the property over towards the Institute, looking out over our wet prairie after it has um, rained and our cistern allows for the water to stay there and to seep down. If it is too much for our um, cistern to hold 252,000 gallons of water, it will be drained into the city slowly uh, or the city systems. So again, you wanna have plants that can tolerate drought and wet. Um, we've had many people tell us that mallard ducks show up as they're flying through um, on their passages. And um, again, one of my favorite grasses, or I guess I have so many, is the bushy blue stem. And then the Texas sedge is um, just wonderful. The little seed pots at the top are just great. So we've left the cistern and we're gonna walk around. So the cistern was over here by where these people are. And you're gonna walk around through by a uh, um, thornless locust tree. Um, I can't think of all the others, but they're listed. And they're gonna come to this black locust bridge. But you're also gonna be standing right in front of, and yes, we do have snow in Texas. I wanted to show that, is what is called our four bay. And a four bay is just a nice hydrology term for it is that pool in front of a dam. And that means that um, our service area, which technically is where the, um, uh, the archives, our supplies, people park, it's a large area of the people who can be um, volunteering or work at the center park down there. So it's a hard surface, non-permeable surface, but we want to again, use that um, collection of water and appropriately. So that is our other um, prairie behind the bridge or behind the dam. And all that water comes through that small little hole right here. And we have seen it when it has rained, uh, when we've had like our nine inch rain over two days, the water all the way up to the grass area. But it will stop because it will be stopped by all this lunar limestone, which is a native limestone from Abilene, but it's not sealed. So through each one of these little columns, the water can seep through, but we want it to set there again to let everything kind of mediate down. And then it goes into our bioswell and back to the cistern. So um, just a quickie about our black locust. Uh, wood. It is um, harvested up in the Northeast from a forest stewardship council certified forest, which means it's been monitored to make sure the good practices. And it also means that we didn't bring in wood from the tropical hardwoods from the, uh, the tropical rainforest. So again, we're trying to be good stewards and utilize native area things. Um, this is just one of my favorite pictures. As you've left the forebay, you would continue a curve through this again, where this rock is, this is another area of our bioswale. You've got your, just a plethora of wonderful wildflowers, some large tall grasses. Um, and it's just again, the um, decomposed granite. And it's just, again, a beautiful sight. Hope you're gonna enjoy this uh, as since it's yucky outside today. So you continue to the amphitheater. And this is kind of the end of where our tour would be. We bring everyone to the amphitheater where we can sit down, ask questions, look out over the Institute. The Oval Office is off to your right from this lower picture down here. Um, one of the great things about this area is one of my favorite bushes, the Texas Mountain Laurel is behind on, the, on this other side. Um, there's I think three bushes last time I counted. They're early spring bloomers. They don't stay long, but they smell amazing. You would just, uh, if you can put one in your landscape, try to find one. And the other thing that is really cool that I like is our Mexican buckeye. There's a couple back here and also at the entrance when you came in. They're a short, small type tree, but this picture um, is just amazing because it gives you the seed pods and that beautiful flower. And it's um, just a really neat tree that um, gives you an indication of uh, how trees actually uh, drop those huge seeds. Um, just, I don't know, I just love it. So um, so just before we leave all this and, and um, go to possible questions, I want you to understand that not only is the park where all the landscape is going on, but there are other areas in the museum. Now the ceremonial courtyard is accessible without going uh, into the actual paid part of the, of the museum and the library. So you could enter 
and go to the ceremonial courtyard as you see it is behind um, and before you get to the Institute. It is uh, kind of a microcosm of, uh, or a microclimate, almost like the Big Bend area. So it's gonna have uh, some yuccas and some um, types of wildflowers that really do thrive in the heat. And two of the really beautiful um, small trees are the mountain, uh, the morning cloud, Chipalta, Chipalta and the bird of paradise. I have the bird of paradise in my little prairie and um, they're great to have. So again, something to think about. The other one that we have is of course the Texas Rose Garden. It is not like the Oval Office Rose Garden in DC. We don't have saucer magnolias. We have Natchez crepe myrtle. We don't have roses, we have autumn sage. We do have a few knockout roses that have survived the rose rosette, but um, we don't do a lot of rose per se. We do have some um, annuals that we do put in that are natives. And so that's what our, um, our rose garden is. But again, you can access that only through paying for a ticket, going through the museum and heading out through the Oval Office um, and see that. So let's see. We have two emphases during the year. And one of them is the wildflowers in the spring, which we were hoping we could do that this year, but I don't know that we will be able to. So again, you had a, a PDF file that was attached during that registration sheet that you had on the website that you could pull off and print. And this is just some of them that you'll see on this. This is what I pulled off some, um, where you'll have some other, um, the grasses also, but mostly you'll have some wildflowers that you could go and see. And they bloom at different times. Um, but the emphasis in the spring, of course, is blue bonnets. Now, our blue bonnet is our state flower. Uh, the state legislature back in 1901, I think people got fed up with saying the blue bonnets in uh, Big Bend area. No, the ones in South Texas. This is the main state flower. So they may basically said all blue bonnets are the state flower, whether it's the Lupinus texensis or the others, that the Havarti, um, whatever. But the one that we see mostly are the Texensis. And um, I'm going to ask another poll here because there's a question that people ask is, is it illegal to pick blue bonnets in Texas? And let's see. Um, and I've gone to, I actually went and pulled off an article from, I think, the Texas Tribune um, just to make sure I had it correct. All right, we'll do, oh, it's 73%. So it's kind of neck and neck. So. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop taking it so we can keep going because I hate to not be a good steward of your time. So 55% say no. And guess what? You're right. Um, it isn't illegal. All right. But if you enter on someone's property to pick those blue bonnets, it is illegal. You are trespassing. So you could say that. But the other part to understand is when you pick a blue bonnet, you have stopped the process for a blue bonnet is a reseeding annual. It is part of the um, bean family, the legumes. And what that means is, again, once they have been pollinated by that bee or the pollinator coming in and getting that nectar, they come in where that flower is white because that is the flower telling it, I have nectar here, come get my nectar. Once they've taken the nectar, that white will be gone and it will just be a blue flower. Once the whole flower has been pollinated, it will then keep going to develop that seed pod the seed pod will eventually dry out. And some people say they hear it pop. Those seeds look like little rocks. They're very hard. They need to be scarified or sandpapered or stomped on if you're gonna plant them at your own residence. And if you have bought them at a nursery and planted them, know that they are reseeding, not like they're gonna come back from that main original plant. So you wanna collect those seeds and try to help them along or just be aware if they don't come back the next year. So again, it's not illegal but please don't pick them or possibly any other wildflower unless there's um, like eight plants over here and you pick one because you want them to potentially actually go through that perennial process or if they are receding, you want those seeds to go through or if they are an annual itself, you know, they're gone. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The other emphasis we have is in the fall and this we are hoping we can do. It's called Monarch Mania in the Park and we tag monarchs, that's me tagging. Uh, really exciting to do that. Um, there's a whole process. We have an education class. We tell you all about the 
the life cycle, um, why you should plant milkweeds. Uh, we also talk not just about the monarchs, but the hummingbirds and Turk's cap is a great plant for hummingbirds. Um, why you wanna have plants in the fall, specifically for your monarchs, like your tall goldenrod, which is right here, which some people feel looks like a ragweed, but it's not. Ragweed is wind pollinated. This wonderful um, tall plant needs to have bees. You'll see right there and butterflies and another, that's a little moth right here, um, to pollinate it and to help it to continue to produce um, seeds. So uh, keep tabs on our website. We will be hoping to have this as to when, usually we try to do it during the native plant week of October and it's usually on a Saturday and we try to have the Prairie Society, the Master Naturals, Master Gardeners, the uh, Native Plant Society of Texas, and us uh, as far as docents giving tours and tagging monarchs. So keep in, uh, we'll try to get that publicized if we do actually have a chance to do it. And if I have time, I'm just three more slides, but what I wanna do is, this is my little pocket prairie. And why I'm showing you this has not been, it looks a little haphazard and all that, but what I want you to take away from the Bush Library is one, in the middle of Dallas, you can go and visit a prairie. And it's kind of amazing that it's there. But you can also take away that you can do that too. You can add, I have Indian grass right up here. That is my bird of paradise. Um, there's the tall um, uh, wine cup. Um, I have fennel. And the reason I have fennel is because I am bringing caterpillars in. So this is a um, Gulf fritillary caterpillar. And then we get into the, it's beginning to make its chrysalis and there's our chrysalis. And then this is um, an Eastern swallowtail uh, caterpillar. And this, if you can see it, is the fennel has gone, uh, been distressed and I have ladybugs because they're eating the, uh, they came, ate the, alpha, the aphids, laid their eggs, the um, eggs actually hatch and the um, larva eats the aphids. So um, it's okay if you have some bugs in your garden. And of course, there's my monarch, and I had a, um, a bee survey I was doing, and so I planted also for bees. But you can put, and it's not anything um, spectacular designed, I just kind of drop things in, lots of salvias and yarrow. And if you could see behind my Engelman daisy, which is the yellow daisy over here, I have two uh, tomato plants mainly because the bees that came into this area helped pollinate my bee, my tomato plants and I had great celebrities. So just saying, think about where you could put something into your landscape. Um, don't have to have a rain barrel, but it will be drought tolerant plants that will just bring in some really good stuff. So if you build it, they will come. So lastly, there's some resources that if you wanna know more about, and I'll be glad to make this into a Word document and share with um, Helen to be able to be sent out to you. But the other thing is that Mrs. Bush wanted to continue this, not just as at the Bush Center, but back in 2011, she helped found Texas by Nature. And that is a website you can go to, and it was developed um, to unite the conservation and business leaders who believe that our state's prosperity is dependent on the conservation of our natural resources. And understand that in Texas, 95% of the land is privately owned. So that means that we all need to work together, businesses, um, governments, and privately owned um, uh, landowners to really keep our um, resources. There is also, if you wanna get in touch with me, or Sharon Brannon. Dr. Sharon Brannon is our education specialist at the museum. Um, she is, we are under the education department, as you might kind of call it, as the Native Texas Park. And we try to provide um, the brochure that you could access, the wildflowers. There is a tree um, sheet that gives you where all of the their varieties of trees are located, if you wanted to know about that. If you have any need to ask a question that you forget today, you can contact either bush43education at nara.gov or me, Lois S. Diggs, at gmail.com. And the really last thing as to how you could see more about the, the park is one of our docents, um, Mary Lou Simon, has a passion and a desire to share all of this through Instagram. And she has an Instagram page called Mockingbirds and Blue Bonnets exclusively about the Bush Libraries, um, Native Texas Park. 
amazing research pictures. It's great if you have a chance. Uh, you don't have to be a member that I understand or, or join Instagram, but it's got some just amazing information. She's been doing it for several years. So with that said, I'll leave you with this last quote of many years ago. This site would have been a breathtaking Texas prairie for the um, today, the park is planted once again with native habitat for birds, butterflies, and other wildlife. And visitors can visit this state's beautiful natural environment in the center of Dallas. So with that said, hopefully I didn't go over too far on time. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer. If not, I'll take your email and get back with you. How's that? Thank you so much, Lois. And I think uh, you are no worries on time. Just to let everybody know, this program will will go at a little after 1 p.m. We're going to make sure we get to all of your questions. We completely understand if you need to log off and go about your day. Just remember that this program in its entirety will be on the Dallas Public Library's YouTube page. So you can go back and watch the end. You can share it with others. You can uh, refer to it uh, to help plan your visit to the Native Texas Park. And we do have a lot of questions, okay? So do you need, you need a drink of water or something like that before you start firing off the questions? I'll drink some coffee. Okay, that's even better. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, a lot of us are really interested in the different, uh, like the cistern and the all the different kinds of water capture systems and everything like that. So can you, well, how many gallons did that cistern hold? It sounded like a lot. 252,000 gallons. And what is that water used for? Oh, well, it is repurposed. It is actually, if you walk through the park, you will see throughout purple irrigation lines and little irrigation heads. Because if we had to, <clears throat> excuse me, especially say we lost a live oak and we had to put in a new um, tree and we want to water it. So we can zone set that. And it is from that cistern that we bring the water back up. So it is all... Um, repurposed in our irrigation system. A purple line tells you that it's non-potable, which means it's not drinkable, so it is collected that way. We also have a green roof that allows the water from the roof to come down, and that water also is repurposed in our fountain when you come to the front. So that's there, okay? All right, this sounds like a magical place. I can't wait to see it. I actually have been to the, the, the Bush Center once, but it was in the evening for an event, and yeah. of course it was you know dark. So I wasn't able to enjoy the park and I cannot wait to go. So speaking of that, there was a question about the park. Is it open and what are the hours? How can people visit it? Sure, you can come any day of the year, 365 days out of the year, sunrise to sunset. Um, my goal this year is to try to get some uh, birders who will help us right at sunrise have a bird, a bird tour. But that again is later on, I'm working with some master naturalist on that. But you can park in the parking lot for the uh, Bush Library. It does cost, you have to have a credit card to pay and I forgot it's 75 cents an hour or something or less. Um, and you can walk down Bush Avenue and turn in by the Institute or it actually is a, a very small sign that you can turn into the, muse, into the, uh, sorry, the uh, park. And um, understand that because this is a presidential library and Mr. and Mrs. Bush still pursue some of their public policy interest at the Institute and have offices there. There is security. And that means that you will see the towers with the round camera. So they're not recording you, but they do need to be aware. And so it is a very safe environment, um, but it is only open sunrise to sunset because we don't put out lights. We do not have any light. Well, that's uh, and I can talk a lot, so tone me down if I tell you, tell you too much. I'll, I'll do my best on that, but I don't know. But that's really good. You know, we, we talked about like with birds and the lights out and helping migrating birds without having lights like in your parking lot and in your park at night. There's right. many, many benefits to that just besides the energy savings. Right. Okay. So we actually had one of our uh, participants, Laura, uh, look through those materials that were provided and she wonders if there might be a typo in one of those. Oh, I, I would guarantee it. <laughs> now, which one was it? And I don't know. Okay, so she's wondering if now I'm going to, I don't even think I'm going to try to pronounce the Latin names, but 
Western ironwood or is it Western ironweed? Um, if we're talking a common name, it could probably be either one. Um, the problem with our handout that was the intro like this is when we did this, we did not put the botanical nomenclature name in it. So um, a lot of common names have many names common to it. So, but are, is she saying that we need to change the Western Ironwood to a different name? The Veronia Baldwini, the Baldwinii, that it might actually be Western Ironwood instead of Western Ironweed. Okay. And it's probably right, so, um, so we need to put ironwood. Okay, I've written it down. Thank you. That's why it takes a community to read these things. We are all volunteers who help Ms. Dr. Brannon at the Institute. All these things that you will see have been put together by um, volunteers. Um, so she is the only paid employee that, that is dealing with all this and we volunteer and help her. So thank you. If you ever find, uh, please keep us informed. Absolutely. So speaking about the volunteers, uh, can you talk a little bit about the volunteers who lead these tours like you and oh. what are their qualifications and what kind of training do you have to go through? Um, if somebody actually wants to come and help us, uh, we have a uh, park docent manual. Um, you need to um, go on tours with us, specifically those. There are five, I would say, right now. Um, two of us are master naturalists. Uh, two of us, well, I'm a master gardener also and a uh, master gardener. Uh, Mary Lou goes with us taking photos and also helping us identify because she is just become so engrossed in it. You do not need to be able to identify every plant out there because um, that's just uh, really hard to ask people of. But we have gone through either extensive training on our own as master naturalists, master gardeners, um, several, two of our um, docents volunteer at the Heard Museum up um, in, outside of McKinney area and they take an extra training. We've taken training about monarchs, um, the education courses that we provide. There are also uh, classes through the Native Plant Society of Texas, the Dallas chapter called, I'm going to get this wrong, the Native Landscape Certification Program, level one, two, and three. And most of us have taken that also. Um, so um, we try to keep up to date. And so that's what our training is. But anyone can volunteer as a um, docent in the library or in the park. Um, in the park, you have to fill out some paperwork and um, go through all of this. You don't have to be a docent doing the tours. You can just help also during the two events. Okay, so we also have a few questions about some of the plants. Uh, okay, so Karen was hoping that you could explain a little bit more about the sedges, which ones are desirable and why? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason is I'm just learning. I have my big book um, and I didn't mean to be abrupt with the no, but I don't want to lead you astray. What I can do is if she will email my Lois S. Diggs at gmail.com, I will send you every kind of, I love research and I will give you um, more info than you might want. So ask her, or if you're listening to me, please send me um, an email and just in the subject say sedges at NTP, you know, and I'll do the research and I'll get back with you. And this is what we do on our tours is that I don't know, but I'll get back with you. All right. Okay, so uh, Kyle wanted to let you know that this was an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. And he was curious about what are the flowering vines which grow on the wall next to Central Expressway service road? The flowering vine growing on the wall as you're going down Central Expressway. Okay, I'm gonna give this a I don't know in the sense of, it's really hard even as a master gardener or master naturalist for somebody to say if I don't have an actual picture or more of a description, like even like what color. Um, so I really apologize, but again, if you send me an email, I will figure it out. Okay, so they said it has orange flowers, maybe it's trumpet vine? Well, I was gonna say it could be the trumpet vine. A uh, trumpet vine is, is very um, um, aggressive. Um, I would suggest that you not put trumpet vine, but put uh, coral vine, or um, Caroline, I've got to find, but it probably is that. 
Um, uh, people still do plant it, but I think uh, the trumpet vine is uh, very aggressive. So, but yes, and, and I'll tell you what, and that's one thing is it's, it's so aggressive that it's going to grow where it wants, not where you want it. And it, if you want to take it out, it's going to, you know, prepare for a war, not, not a battle, but a war to get that stuff out. It has seed pods about this long and um, it's just awful. It's it took me six years to get it off my fence. So <laughs> thank you. And that's probably what it is. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, how do you maintain, so from, uh, Karen wanted to know, how do you maintain the decomposed granite walkways? Well, we actually have to add more. I mean, but when you start, um, you know, you make sure there's no grass or anything and you might have put down um, some kind of permeable um, liner, uh, which they may have done since this is a commercial kind of native Texas park. And then we do put down more decomposed granite. Um, uh, some of our places we have now just kept um, putting the mulch, the hardwood mulch down, and also um, just cutting the habitat grass. So, but you, you do have to kind of keep putting it down periodically. I agree. I, I had used decomposed granite and where I have my rain barrel system, and it's basically over the years, it basically is all washed away. So, I agree yeah. that you have to keep on adding to it. Okay, so speaking of that, what yeah. are the challenges in maintaining three different ecoregions in one area? Well, it's hard whether they're the ecoregions or not. Just um, if you were on a true prairie or the cross timbers or even in the post oak savanna, you would have um, potential, uh, once in a while you might have a fire. You know about Blackland Prairie where there would be fires. You would have um, different animals and things going on. But here in a city, we can't do as much of that. And um, because we're organic and we, uh, we can't bring in like cattle, um, cattle don't eat your blue bonnets. That's why when you'll see out in these wonderful fields, all these blue bonnets and no grass, well, we get some grass in there because of the seeds that develop and we can't bring in the cattle to eat the grass. Um, and it's a real challenge with the invasive, the birds that come in and say your privet, um, which is an awful thing to have, or um, uh, Bermuda grass that is constantly coming in. So the uh, Southern botanical people who are just amazing um, at maintaining, we, we try to be good stewards at letting things um, develop as they need. This year we've seen, um, I don't have the botanical name, but it's poverty weed. And it's a beautiful, um, a fairly large bush, but it is taking over. And so um, we try to then help others to fill in, to take off that. And you know, so um, it is a real challenge and some of us would like them to do better on certain things, but we need to be aware that we let nature do what it needs to do. Um, so it, it is a challenge. Absolutely, a prairie or any ecosystem wasn't made in a day, right? Yeah. All right, so Janet would like to know, where did you get your native plants that you originally planted? Did you collect seeds? You did mention like the grass seed, but what about the, the flowers? The actual grasses, um, uh, several of them and the plants, I got at the Texas Discovery Garden, um, which is down at Fair Park, and you can just um, do an internet search for that. Again, they are having where they don't have their plant sales as often as what we want because of COVID. Um, but they also have a demonstration garden that has native um, um, plants used. They're almost all going native. So if you um, Google or you contact either your master gardeners in your area, say you're in Collin County um, or say up in Denton or down in Waxahachie or something, um, they could give you where you could probably find a, a native plant um, uh, center, but you're not going to usually find them in a big box store. That's just not usually there. Grass seeds are hard to start from seeds, um, but I'm collecting them because I'm helping a prairie out at White Rock Lake. So, um, but any of the native ones you can usually find, um, I'm just talking the Texas Discovery Garden, but you can find them. Yeah, they, uh, they have some great, and they grow, although they're they collect flex seeds and stuff and they have their own greenhouse and they propagate those plants. So they are adapted to North Texas, like to Dallas. And so if you're gonna have anything that survives, 
you know, the, you can get it from them. So they are great. And they actually just over the weekend just had a indoor plant sale at their uh, location. And they usually have like a spring plant sale and a fall plant sale. So love those folks. And they, they do fantastic work. Okay, so Tony's got a good question. He's, uh, he's saying in an organic program, how is the library controlling invasive forbs and grasses in the front lawn? Also, uh, you said the fertilization program was mostly using mulch. Do you use any fertilizer on the front lawn? The, the fertilizer that I understand would be compost, would be the same kind of compost. Um, you were getting in dairies, I'd have to probably connect with um, Southern Botanical with their person um, as to exactly how we would do that. Um, a lot of it is polling. Um, you will see a lot of the people who are Southern Botanical or even us as volunteers, um, we found some, uh, I don't know if you're aware of, there's a yellow flowering bush called um, Bastard Cabbage, sorry for the name, um, and it can get quite large and I pulled it. Now, um, it's invasive. It's on the Texas invasive species listing. It's not illegal, but it's an invasive. And so I've pulled it. So many of the times they're going to be pulling things. So if you're at the Bush Center and you notice there's a big area that looks kind of worn and uh, exposed soil, and they have a sign that says that it's in process of being reclaimed, that they've gone in because Bermuda has taken over, or um, we found some invasive that needs to really be um, addressed. So we're constantly working on that. But we as volunteers are not asked to do any of the manual things, but you know, if I can reach down and pull something, I will. Absolutely, I, I spent some time this weekend pulling out uh, weeds and you were talk talking about that bastard cabbage. I always get that confused with dandelions because yeah. they, they look a little similar. and. Uh, and I know dandelions are edible, but I don't know about the other one. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, okay. This is a statement from uh, someone called Gardner, and they were talking. Uh, is the crape myrtle the state shrub? Uh, a state shrub. I know that the. Um, uh, I just lost the one that we have. The Natchez crape myrtle is uh, a, a native adaptive, but as far as a sh um, state shrub, you mean uh, like our state grass and all that? Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, and I would have to research that. Um, that I don't know. I'm amazed that we have so many state birds, state insects, state animals, you know. So I don't know that. I, yeah. I will have to figure out all the states. I probably need to know that for the school I volunteer at. So. And then, but uh, you were saying crepe myrtle, I mean, they're, they're not native, are they? Not directly. The, we use native and adaptive uh, uh, because the way our world is going with the way our uh, climate or the way things are happening. Um, some things that have adapted um, because if you, I don't want to get into the what is native, what is not native. Um, and so even though I'm part of the Native Plant Society, there are those who are truly native, but the ones that are coming up from possibly Southern Texas or even Mexico into us because we are getting warmer um, are adapted. So, um, but I didn't do enough research on crepe myrtle before this, so I'm going to do that for the next tour so I can say that. So, thank you. No worries. So we'll thank Gardner for that. Okay, and we're coming towards the end of our question. Um, do you have an iNaturalist program set up to collect observations of birds, bugs, and other critters that use the wonderful native resources provided? You mean like, do we have an iNaturalist site for the Bush Library? I'm assuming is what they're asking. Um, iNaturalist, which I think I maybe even noted in my resource, uh, they try to make sure it's where it's not been planted. Um, it's, it's a wild kind of situation, you know, like say you're out in the woods and um, I, I wouldn't list on my naturalist my grass that I planted because I planted it. It's, um, it's, a, it's so I haven't thought of doing that, but I was going to ask our sponsor for the Dallas chapter of iNaturalist if I could actually set up that so that when people went out there, um, but it's a kind of a catch 22 because botanical nat, uh, Southern Botanical does plant things that we need to fill in, especially our when we redo our wildflowers. So, um, and iNaturalist is used as a research base um, also. So um, I, I won't, don't want to destroy their 
um, process, but if we just set it up as a central, if someone is at the Bush Center, it would go into that grouping. So I was going to ask Sam, our account, sponsor, and see if I could do that. because So maybe it's coming. Yeah. So Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, next time I see Sam. Mm -hmm. All right. So also, okay, this is, I'm going to, I believe it's our last question is, do you have any identification guides of the pollinators that visit the park per season? Not directly in the sense of, um, just like I was noting in that little picture that there was a bee and there was a moth and there was a butterfly, but we have not done that as far as gone out and um, specifically take pictures and noted that. But that again is something that would probably be really good, especially when we do our um, emphasis in the fall with monarchs and we should do it year round. Um, so that again is just another to-do list for us um, because we'd like to be able to have that list to give to people and possibly uh, just expand on the education. So thank you, that's a good list. That's a good idea. Yeah, it is. All right, and then, okay, so we were talking about those vines off of I-75. So, awesome. and, and then also you were, you were trying to remember the name of like a alternate. So yes. it looks like, uh, so it looks like a lot of people participating have a lot of a good, uh, you know, plant and native plant knowledge. So good. perhaps a uh, cross vine or coral honeysuckle. That's it, cross vine. Yeah, I have cross vine up at a school I volunteer at. Wonderful alternative, not as invasive, really great. Yeah. Yes, like it, it is. All right, and so um, with that, we're gonna start concluding. And I just wanna remind everybody that we do not have a program next week. It is President's Day and the library is closed and it is the City of Dallas holiday. Now, the Monday after that, we have a, a little bit, we're taking a little bit of a, a, a different path and we're gonna talk about urban feathered livestock. So if you're interested, we're gonna actually have a farmer who has a farm in Dallas who raises quail, ducks, chickens and pigeons uh, to talk about his experience and, uh, and, with the, and, and how you can even get into that if that's what you're interested in. Um, also this Thursday, we have a program called Earth Day Every Day. It's Thursday at noon. Uh, myself and my coworker are gonna be talking about having a green twist to your Valentine's uh, because you know that's coming up on Sunday, uh, whether we like it or not, that day is coming. And then we also have so that Thursday, this coming Thursday is the, the Tossing Traditions for Valentine's. The following Thursday, we are actually going to have a tree session with two City of Dallas arborists. They're gonna talk about tree selection, tree planting, tree care, and also have a live pruning demonstration. So that one is called Tree TLC, if you wanna register for that program. And then also uh, the Dallas Public Library for Black History Month is featuring uh, three different Dallas vegan chefs this month. Uh, you can watch them. They actually, some of them are doing some cook-alongs and one of those is actually on February 13th, the day before Valentine's, which might be a nice fun activity uh, that you can participate in with your sweetheart. And so uh, Vanessa from the Dallas Public Library has put a lot of good links, links in here. And oh, uh, everyone who registered for this program will get an email in a couple of days that has a link to access the recording has a survey that you can give us. Oh, speaking of which, can someone launch the, the last survey? Uh, it has a survey to help us plan future programming and also all of the links that have been shared by Lois and the, um, the links to the brochures if you didn't get those. So that will be coming in the mail and if you don't, uh, uh, so that you can uh, have all of those wonderful resources that were shared today. And if you don't mind, this is a really quick uh, poll, your last one. It's only three questions and it helps us with our future programming. And so Lois, uh, thank you. Thank you so very much for being with us today. And if you have anything you want to close out with or share, please do. No, just thank you for coming. Come to the Bush Center when you can. It's open up, you know, as I say, every day. Um, and think native and think putting in some grass and something that will bring you great joy um, in your landscape. All right. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you, everybody.